Hey YouTube, it's Demetri, and today we're going to talk about the issue of what a quantitative finance manager is, what they do, and do they even exist. Um, so I've been thinking about this from a variety of perspectives, I don't know, probably at least the last year or two. Um, one of you commented, so shout out and thank you for the comment, I never responded because I was going to make a video, and then I thought about it, and then I didn't know what to say. Um, there was a comment that was like, hey, Dimitri, you trying to basically skate this world of management, senior expectations, and then at the same time, you're trying to do the quant work. Seems like you found an amazing fit where you're at. Uh, you know, pretty impressive, right? This seems kind of like the dream here. And then the reality is I don't know how to respond to that because I'm basically being torn in half. And so it's been a weird, awkward struggle, both physically, emotionally, and mentally. Um, there's a lot of things that have been driving a lot of my stress lately, things that don't come up to the surface or have talked about that often, but I think a lot of quants are facing. And part of the struggle from what I'm explaining is that most of us go, Dimitri, what is the career path for a quant? Well, there's not one. That's the unfortunate reality. Nobody really knows what quants do or where they go. Um, we're so improperly defined of what quants are versus not quants versus the funds and industries and parts they work in. It could be at a bank or an investment firm. Uh, there's really no clear path anywhere. And a lot of us just end up floating through careers. And then that's just it. There's not like a goal. And I think this is true in life in general, to be honest with you guys. If you think about like, let's let's take an easy path here. Um, let's say you're going to be a finance professional, right? You're going to be a financial analyst. You're going to work up as a financial associate, um, maybe a, a vice president, SVP, managing director through some sort of firm here. Eventually, you become a you know, chief financial officer. And then maybe you end up hitting CEO and you say, okay, that is the path of a, you know, a finance major, right? Well, you might be able to say, okay, let's let's do the hand wavy exercise with quants here as well. Let's say, you know, we take, uh, you know, you get a quant, you start as an associate because analyst is beneath us. Uh, so we typically start as an associate titles, then you go through AVP, VP, SVP, um, directors, you know, associate director, all that, director, managing director. Uh, and then maybe you go into chief risk officer, but that title and role doesn't exist. Like I was explain, trying to explain this to someone recently. Chief risk officers really weren't a thing until 2010 when they were mandated by Dodd-Frank Act. And a lot of the banks said, screw that. We're not going to have CROs. This is a stupid idea. And then they ended up having CROs because they got mandated by the Federal Reserve to do it. So that was 2010. I started my career in 2014. So I had a very, very lucky career path um, of talking and listening to um people from other areas. These were not quants. There were not quants that were CROs. They took a bunch of business people, business degrees and MBAs um, and all that. And they made them CROs because who the hell is going to be a CRO? Like they don't want to put a quant on there, right? And quants didn't work a lot of these firms um, pre-2010, at least on the bank side. And often they were in, they were there, but they weren't in the risk sides of it, but they were in other areas and they were kind of hidden around doing work for these institutions. Um, and they just never went into those roles. But then this new weird executive title popped up. And so they started, you know, saying, hey, let's do that. So let's pretend you go through that route and then you become CRO. And then I guess CEO, but not really because most CROs actually report into the board of directors. They don't report into the CEOs. Though they work directly with a dotted line, uh, as many of you know, in a lot of institutions to your CEO here. So there's really no clear career path in the quant finance space. And what a lot of us end up doing is you work somewhere as a junior quant, uh, you end up getting towards more like the senior levels, and then you say, screw this, I wanna do something fun and exciting. And you start to just do research and you learn and you really get you know, wrapped up more in what you started with. It's kind of this full circle process where you started super academically excited, then you get stuck in solving all these problems for the business, but often you're not getting the time to actually do research. And then finally you become senior level. Um, you either give up and just do the job and collect the paycheck, or you end up in another position where you end up saying, screw it. I can do this in my sleep and you do it in your sleep. Um, and then you focus heavily on doing research and other side projects, or you go into kind of, like I said, you 
you give up uh, and you spend more time on family and other things that are more important here. But I don't think many quants more or less make it. Um, there are a lot of other quants also that get to some point and then they leave and just start their own firm, right? Why am I going to deal with this structure? This corporate structure is awful. Uh, I'm going to go out and I'm going to start my own fund and my own firm and do my own thing. And they end up going that path within themselves here. And there's been two, there's been two books, for example, that have just been like tearing at me that I, I need to get on. I don't have the time. I don't have the mental bandwidth because I am spending so much time focusing on a million other things that need to get done, should be done, but I'm not getting done to what I mentally want to get done. So I thought I'd kind of share a few of these with you um, to show you the, 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 the perspective of this. There's this book I've been trying to find. It's uh, Ex Exploring General Equilibrium by Fisher Black. It's not a very thick book. Um, I got this as a gift, and this actually came out of a library, I believe. Um, doesn't say exactly where on here. Uh, but this came out of a library and it's got some notes in it. And I think there was, oh, they don't have it in here. Um, but there were some kind of notes and stuff. And this is, this was a library book and I bought it. Got it as a gift. So thank you, mom. Uh, my mom gave me this book and it's been on my list to read. And people are asking why. Well, me and Fisher Black, he has some sort of writing style that really connects. So when I started my quant finance career, I fell in love with quant finance because of a lot of the books and writings of Fisher Black, about Fisher Black. And no, I don't really care about his, you know, he made the Black-Scholes model. Uh, most of his work was actually in finance and economic theory, but then looking at it through the lens of a mathematical approach. But this, this book has just been like eluding me of like, I need the time to read the book to just personally fulfill my interests. I, I need to do something of value. Um, and unfortunately, I haven't had a lot of time to do that. Um, the second book was, I started going through a used bookstore. Um, and this book I found on uh, Romanian geometry. And I just haven't had time to look at it. I have no intention of using it for any sort of modeling. Um, I have no actual problem. Uh, the topic itself just sounds fascinating. And as I like scroll through this book, it has some interesting mathematics in it, it looks like. Um, and there were some cool pictures. I can find it. I don't think I can find the, the picture I was looking for. Um, but the book itself is, it's, yeah, it's, it's real math. Like, I don't know if you can see it. But it just goes into an area of math I haven't spent time on. And I've I felt like I have not had time to enrich my mathematical soul uh, of going down that rabbit hole of discovering that. And then I had a discussion recently with someone who is a hiring manager. And they were talking about, you know, what makes great quants. And they were talking about this. They said, you know, there was like these different attributes they're looking at. And essentially, they don't hire people that are experts and specialists. They look for people that are just well-rounded. I find this to be complete BS, to be quite honest with you. Um, <laughs> I'm going to tell you this. I've been hiring for a while now. Uh, I don't go out and find people and say, oh, I'm really looking for someone well-rounded. Um, the reason I say that is because typically people say quants do math and technical work a lot, and then you have communication skills and some other skills. We'll put hand-wavy skills around that. And people say they want well-roundedness between you know communication and technical ability. Um, I think what it is is there's a bare minimum of communication that needs to be met to pair with the technical skills to make it happen. But I'm not gonna lie to you guys. Being extremely technical is very, very hard. The more technical you become, the more you're going to be dubbed as not a great communicator. And the reason for this is because when you get into more complicated concepts, it is extremely hard to explain to someone of the average mindset, say business person, professional, student, whatever. It's hard to explain to the average person something so complex, especially when you start getting into like math and theory and finance, because I have to explain something to you and it has like 10, 20 dimensions and why the impacts are critical and why we're even, why I'm even having this conversation of going through this. And I find myself going back over and over talking about the world's most simple things. And so I have a lot of people say, Dimitri, why do you spend so much time talking about, I don't know, something like linear regression? And the reality is because people are too dumb to understand linear regression. I'm sorry. That's just how it seems to be. And so even when I go and I explain the linear regression and we draw the model out, 
people don't seem to grasp what we are actually doing. Um, they do not grasp either that their relationships themselves are linear, not the actual model or the ma the problem itself. So I get people that will just stupidly plot things out. Like they'll plot out whatever you're modeling in finance with time and they go, it's not linear. Can't use a linear model. And I'm just like scratching my head. Like, should I say something? Should I do something? Or should I just roll over and pretend like we just, you know, we just don't care. Um, so I think it's challenging. I think there is this hard nut to crack for, I think, most quants. And unfortunately, I wish I had an answer for you guys. Um, I'm in the exact same struggling boat myself where, like I said, I feel like I am being torn in half. Um, part of me is like I, I have this quant half of me and it feels like it's dying because I don't really get to sit and just do quant work that often anymore. Um, the majority of my time is spent doing management stuff. So um, I, I don't dislike it, but I also think in the quant space, you're almost required to be a quant to be a manager because managers make such poor decisions not understanding what quants do. Um, and there's a variety of things I will not talk about that have occurred recently on this, but it's just like you don't, we, we're not the same. And I don't know how to explain this, but we are not the average same person as a business person or a marketing person or someone else. Um, I was having a conversation recently with someone about this and they come from the artsy side and I was explaining it as like writing a book. So I'll give you an example of this. Try to give a little light. Um, imagine you have somebody that's doing something like the tech world where they check in on you daily and you have all these daily meetings and they consistently check in on you all the time. Now imagine you take an author and you hand them a pencil and a piece of paper and you sit them down at a desk. So imagine this desk behind me. I sit you down behind me. It's dead silent in here. There's no way around, nothing going on. Maybe you hear the, the humming of the neighbor's mower, but that's about it. Maybe some birds chirping. And I say, okay, can you, can you write, write me a, write me the next great American novel. Go ahead write it out real quick. All right, I'll wait for you. And you're sitting there like, uh, I don't know what to do. Um, you know, like you're on the spot and say, no, 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 no I'll, I'll give you a break. I'll come back and check on you. And every day I come in and I check on you and say, where are you at? Where are you at? Where are you at? What chapter are you writing? It's demoralizing. It is disrespectful. It is frustrating. Um, because this is like quant work. It's like me giving you like this textbook, for example, and saying, Hey, learn, learn this, learn Riemann's geometry, or, you know, build me a model here. Here's all the materials, build me a model. I'm going to check on you every single time over and over and over and over again. It is frustrating. It is irritating. You really need a quant manager. That's going to tell everybody above that is managing these. This is stupid. This is a dumb idea. This is awful. You know, you need to respect the process of quants and quant finance. The job is just so different. I really don't know how to explain it to anybody because people say, oh, you go through these motions and you follow these steps. And then I'm like, no, but you, you don't. You don't. Um, you have to talk to the business. You have to understand the details. Every business person I've ever worked with has always had some special requirement that they want that is different. And I respect it. I respect the fact that you want something different. Um, you have a different use case. You have a different perspective. And so when we go through the model development process here, and one of the old debates I had, and I worked at Santander with a buddy of mine and a few other colleagues, my team actually at, at Santander in the validation space um, in Dallas here, is we would argue over how much of quant finance is science and how much of it is art. And the argument was multi-year argument back and forth between the proportions of these halves. Because in my head, it was like it's 50-50, right? Easy assumption. And my colleague's like, no, it's really not. It's like 90-10, 90% science, 10% art. My other colleague's like, no, it's really like 10% science, 90% art. And the reality is none of us are right, right? Every problem has a different level of artistic design, understanding, market pieces that are not known or seen through the data itself. Um, and often that artistic design leads us to explore different things within the data, not because the data, you know, told me to go explore it. It's because the artistic drive and design and the business framework and some theory, you know, I've even been in meetings and had people complain about issues they're having not even related. And then it sparks in my head like, oh, that is what we need to do for this model. We need to design this a little bit differently because I, 
they, they said this and this impacts this other division. And when this impacts this other division, we are going to see the following waterfall effects and they're going to want it to do this. And they have no idea they want it to do this. And then you start to think through this differently and you start to put different restrictions on the model. And I think this is where we end up in the frustrating space as a quant is where artists, mathematical, statistical artists putting together designs and frameworks and trying to put all these pieces together here. Um, and so for those reasons and for my vast frustration, which I can't fully explain to you on YouTube, um, it would take me probably multiple novels of ranting and putting exact examples of all the issues I face an entire career here. And, you know, it's just my perspective. It's talking to friends and other people in the industry and they voice similar but different issues. Being a quant is very challenging within itself. Learning to manage quants to guide them, to direct them, provide great insight to them and make good decisions to help support them is extremely hard if you're not a quant. It's just like you can't, you can't, you just can't learn it, right? You can't have that experience yourself because you've never been a quant. Um, and so I think in that aspect of it, I think often you end up with really poorly designed quant teams, quant structures, um, even more broader, you can say risk structures, risk departments, risk understanding, because there's not a lot of people that understand all the parts and pieces and risk is too broad of a concept to be honest with you guys. Um, it covers lots and lots of business departments, but when you just look at the quant space in itself, it's hard to figure out how you would ever manage that properly and make decisions on the work of the people below you, unless you fully understand what the hell they're doing, what they are going through, how they work and how the process kind of churns together. And this really goes into something that struck me recently. I've been reading uh, Rick Rubin's book. Uh, I think it's called like the creative process or the creative path or something like that. Uh, I'll put a picture up here as well. Um, and it's going through the artist, you know, process here. And like, it's really ringing true to me. It's really hitting kind of a note with me. And it's like, I feel it. I understand it. Um, this is what I'm going through as a quant in the process here. One of developing yourself, right? You're developing interests, hobbies, like in the quant space specifically, research topics, ideas. Um, we just don't seem to nourish and support the quants that well when you're not a quant. Uh, when you're a quant and you have to lead to manage and go into these different management positions, it partially kills you because you spend so much time fighting, arguing, and battling to protect your teams to keep some sort of cohesion and excitement in the quant team because nobody else fully grasps it. And then I want to just punch people in the face and they say, Dimitri, you should just explain this to us. And it's like, I'm sorry, I cannot fully explain this to you because you've never done this. Um, it's not something I can just like say, oh, here are five English words put together. And now you go, aha, that makes complete sense. Let me help you out. Uh, you really do need to be a quant to be senior management, but I can tell you, uh, it is a little bit defeating, a little bit soul crushing because you lose a lot of your quant material. You really start second guessing yourself because you're just not doing it anymore. You aren't coding as much. You aren't reading as much. You aren't researching as much. And you're definitely not building as many models as you'd like to build. So I think it's a challenging spot to be in, guys. I'd love to hear in the comments below anyone who is senior, who has faced this challenge, where they have gone, what they have done, where they are headed or where they ended up at. Maybe someone who's a little bit older. Um, it'd be nice to see where everyone else is doing and how you're coping with this. But in general, it is a very, very hard thing to do. There's really no crystal clear path to quant finance. And unfortunately, since a lot of this realm has been fairly new, 10, 20, 30, maybe 50 years at the most, um, there's not a lot of like figured out common paths, procedures, and understanding even from businesses on how to cope with this. So anyways, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And as always, until next time. Mm -hmm.